Welcome to another Tudor Cameo episode. These very short episodes will be slotted in between the normal ones and will cover those characters who made a fleeting yet tantalizing appearance in other episodes. We don't always have a lot of information about them, so they can't have a full episode of their own, but they are too interesting to abandon completely, and they help fill in the gaps and enable us to create as full a picture of an era as we can. And today, Pietro Torrigiano. We're back in Italy again. <laughs> Just a bit all my time in Italy. And we've come across him in a lot of people's episodes. Margaret Beaufort was the first time we spoke of him. Yeah. I'm sure there must be lots of others. Yes, because he did all the sculptures and tombs in England mm -hmm. for a while. He was their go-to sculptor. He was the artist, really, yes. wasn't he? Yes. Yeah, because we said in the background the episode that we that England was just so far behind. Yes, so we had to pull people from other places. In this episode, we come across a surprising number of names that we've heard before. Really? Hmm. Okay. Some of the information about Torrigiano's early years can be taken with a pinch of salt, I think. The information is very specific about some aspects, but I'm not sure how accurate it is. And the reason I doubt it is because it's mainly from Benuto Cellini, who knew Torrigiano but didn't much like him, Ah, and Vasari. So it may be based on gossip and hearsay. Right. He appears in Vasari's Life of the Great Artist, but he's not one of the biographies of the book. He's a bit player, really. Okay. But I don't think that's an, I don't think that's an indictment of Torrigiano's talent. It may be more for the fact that he didn't stay in Italy but travelled around Europe, because Vasari is quite Italy centred. Okay. Because the only we discovered that the only person that he mentions outside of Italy was Van Eyck. Right. I wonder if that's because he didn't have access or because he felt that only Italian artists were worthy of being discussed. A lot of the artists he knew anyway. Right. Or if he didn't know them, because I don't think he met Leonardo, but he met Leonardo's adopted son. Right. So he could talk to people straight, get, the, get it straight from the horse's mouth, I suppose. Yes, and if people are wondering what we're talking about for Leonardo, he is one of our Patreon episodes. So if you he want is. to learn about Leonardo, well, which was a great episode. He yeah. is four of our Patreon yes. episodes. <laughs> episodes. Then please join us on Patreon and you'll hear all about him. Please do. Torrigiano was born at noon on the 22nd of November 1472. So there, I told you it was specific. Very specific. <laughs> well, people kept information like that, didn't they? Because you could make birth charts yes. if you knew what time. Which is always surprising to me why we don't have the information for everybody, since everybody was so into astrology. Well, I suppose it depends where the information would be. I mean, sometimes yeah. it's written in the family Bible, wasn't it? And if it? you're a woman. <laughs> a woman, it doesn't matter, does it? <laughs> no, not at all. He was the third of six brothers. Or if you prefer, the fifth of eight children. The, you know, the first thing I read said the third of six brothers, and the second one said the fifth of eight children. I thought, why don't they focus on the brothers? There's, there's two girls. There's, there's two girls, come on. Yeah. His father was a silk merchant and had vineyards. So they're you know, reasonably well off. Yes. It's thought that Torrigiano started his apprenticeship in the workshop of Ferrocchio, which was where Leonardo was trained. Ah, okay. Mm. But Torrigiano was headhunted by Lorenzo the Magnificent. Ah, <laughs> I'm excited. I, I would like to learn about him. I'm I, I told that it is quite an interesting life to go through. Oh, it's, yes, the bits I've come across. Yeah, we got we've gotten hints. Yes. He was then taken to the workshop that Lorenzo patronized in San Marco. And one of the other head huntees was Michelangelo. Wow. Hmm. They studied terracotta, bronze and marble sculpture. But although he did work in other media, terracotta remained Torrigiano's favourite, and he would paint them in a lifelike way, so they were 3D portraits. Oh, OK. And they are really lifelike, because we're used to seeing things like that now. But it, that, at that time, they must have seemed amazing. A bit like going yes. into Madame Two Swords now, and you're not quite sure who's a waxwork and, and who yes. isn't. Yes, yes. 
because it's it's not the same as looking at a 2D portrait. You can walk round them and yes. look at them from different angles of different shadows. That and quite a few of the portraits are stylized, so they would mm. adjust the way you look to a specific style that was popular at the time, whereas if he's doing actual lifelike portraits, mm. that would be a shock. Because a lot of the ones we looked at from the early time in this season, they've got that sort of rather winsome, weak little smile, haven't yes, they? Yes, all of them, most of mm. them. And they all look the same. Mm -hmm. Jasper looks like Arthur. And they yes. all look exactly the same. Yeah. While he was training at San Marco, the students were taken out to copy some frescoes, which is a common enough exercise for art students. While they were there, Michelangelo started mouthing off about how much better his drawings were than everyone else's. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We heard in Leonardo's episode how incredibly irritating he was. Because he even got Leonardo's back up, back up and yes. he seemed a very tolerant person. Yes. Maybe too competitive? Yeah, very much so. And he was four years younger than Torrigiano. And Torrigiano suddenly flipped and punched Michelangelo <laughs> full in the face. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why that's funny, but it is kind of funny. It's because it's Michelangelo. It's someone yes. famous. Yes. <laughs> if, it, if it was somebody, <laughs> anybody else, you'd say, oh. Yeah. But, that and Michelangelo came across as quite a jerk in the Leonardo really episode. Did. So mm. you kind of think, well, learn to be quiet. <laughs> yes. But as he was later to tell Cellini, he remembered, quote, clenching my fist and giving him such a blow on the nose that I felt the bone and cartilage go down like biscuit beneath my knuckles. And, the, and this mark of mine, he will carry with him to his grave, unquote. Oh, yuck. Mm. <laughs> Which he did. All the portraits show Michelangelo oh, with, with, a, <laughs> with a yeah, noticeable nasal disfigurement. <laughs> At least that's what I read. So I studied a few of the portraits closely and his nose looked fine to me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, maybe I've got low standards of noses, but it looked all right to me. OK. Mm. Vasari had a slightly different version of the event. He said that Torrigiano was insanely jealous of Michelangelo's achievements and hit him out of envy. Possible? Possible, yeah, but Vasari is very much team Michelangelo. Ah, OK, bias. He's ahead of even Leonardo in Vasari's top ten. Really? Hmm. Hmm. And, yeah, when, as you say, when we came across Michelangelo in Leonardo's episode, we wanted to punch him in the face. Yes, we did. It was not <laughs> nice. I think people were queuing up to punch him in the face. And it's funny, he wasn't irritating. He didn't make you angry, angry, angry. It was just, just be quiet. Just mm. be quiet. If you don't have to say it, don't say it. Yes. <laughs> Torrigiano was then either banished by Lorenzo or he chose to jump before he was pushed. This seemed a bit odd to me. In such violent times, does a brawl between two art students really yes. lead to banishment? No. Well, apparently, Not for yes, the other things did. Lorenzo had to get people out of. Yes. <laughs> well, I suppose maybe it was just one more thing. I said, I can't put up with these it, crazy people anymore. True. <laughs> yes. Putting me in awkward positions. He almost seems like a schoolmaster <laughs> for yes. all the things. He was getting people out of trouble and dealing with problem, trouble, children. Yeah. Yes. See me in my study after school. <laughs> I have a cane. <laughs> Torrigiano then travelled around, working first in Bologna, then in Rome, where he did some stucco and marble decoration in the Borgia apartments in the Vatican for Alexander VI. That's pretty high up for somebody who's sort of expelled themselves. Hmm. Hmm. Well, maybe he just said, all I did was punch Michelangelo in the nose, and they said, well, yeah, fair enough. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Later, he was commissioned by Adriano Castellesi, when he was Alexander's papal, papal secretary. So you see what I mean about all the names coming up that we've yes. come across before? He was commissioned to make tombs, monuments, even marble doorways for the building that is now Nostra Signora de Sacro Cuore in Do Rome. Do those still exist? I presume so. The building exists. Perfect. It was around this time that Torrigiano signed up as a mercenary. Uh, what? <laughs> <laughs> That comes across as very random, although the punching matches for a mercenary. Yeah, we think of artists as being rather effete characters these days, but definitely if you get characters like Torrigiano and 
Caravaggio, who was indicted for murder, they were obviously a bit more butch and muscular and yeah, either like butch violent. Or we just assume that artists are peaceful. That's mm. that's what it is. They're creating this beautiful whatever it is they're making, the sculptures, the paintings, they're all gorgeous. You can't equate that with somebody who's gonna well, kill somebody in the in Caravaggio's mm. case, but punching somebody and then becoming a mercenary? Yeah, it's very discordant. Mm, it is to us now. Mm -hmm. But I suppose artists were very different things in those days. I mean, you had to you had to live. Yes. Yeah, you did. Which uh, wasn't always easy. Yeah, mer mercenary. First in the army of Cesare Borgia. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> <I'm> sorry. <laughs> then with Florence against Pisa. And then with another... Uh, Piero de' Medici, Lorenzo's uh, useless son, yeah, and the, and the French. Well, he had plenty of options for how often so many things were at war. Yes, yes you Spoiled could pick, for pick your battle. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that hilarious? It'd be like a buffet of, of battles. Which one do I want to go in? Uh, that one. <laughs> mm. Apparently he was a well-respected soldier. Really? If you can, can you be a well-respected mercenary? I'm not sure, but... I don't know. He was. By 1503, he'd packed in the army and returned to Florence, which makes it sound as if he jumped before he was banished, where he married and had one child. Okay, so he had enough of an income to get married. Hmm. Okay. He was doing quite a lot of work as he travelled around, around Italy, not as a mercenary, presumably. He didn't just stop and do a quick altar while he was between battles, I, I presume. Was he having trouble getting paid like Leonardo was? Do we know? I don't know. Okay. I don't know. I, I know when he gets to England, he's paid. Yes, we don't seem the same, see the same difficulties of payment in England as we do in Italy. But when they keep having to take the money away to go to battle, you can understand why. Hmm. Well, two of Torrigiano's main patrons, that's Piccolomini, the cardinal protector of England, and Castellesi, along with several of the Italian banking families, they had strong links with the church and courts of England and Spain. So yes. this might explain his next travels. In April 1510, he was in the court of Margaret of Austria. Then in the following year, we have his first documented commission in England, and that is the tomb of Lady Margaret Beaufort. <laughs> <laughs> she died two years earlier, uh, for, for which much I know, that's why I know that he does get paid. He got 500 quid for that. Oh, that's pretty good. Yeah, not bad. I would expect more for the... We, we saw her tomb in her episode and it's stunning. It's absolutely gorgeous. Well, he was working from someone else's drawings for her tomb. And okay. apparently it shows um, there was there's to, uh, Torrigiano's Renaissance take plonked onto Maynard Werrick's rather less flamboyant design. And Werrick was the one who painted the portrait of Margaret saying her prayers in that nun-like get-up that we looked at all that yes. time ago. Yeah, way back when. Yes. <laughs> oh, we were young and innocent in those <laughs> days. <laughs> we thought this was going to be so quick and easy. <laughs> It's just getting longer and longer. <laughs> so apparently in her tomb, there are two different schools of painting butting up against each other. But I must admit, I couldn't see it myself. But I'm not an, no, I'm not an art expert. No, it just Yeah. I think she'd be very happy with it since she looks very pious. Yes, she does. <laughs> and I do like down the side, if you're looking at the picture, down the side, there's those sort of long tower things with um, windows. Oh, yes. Yes. I wondered if that's to do with her being patron of colleges and buildings. They look very much like the, the building that she um, paid for. Hmm. I mean, nothing there is likely to be without reason, is it? Because that's no. how they did things. But it doesn't, I would expect portcullises to be somewhere or, or dice. <laughs> <laughs> A nice little glass of something. Yes. <laughs> Perhaps she's got the, this little glass of something hidden amongst the folds of her cloak. I always find it adorable that for some reason they put two pillows underneath the person's head. <laughs> yeah. And often a little dog or a little At the creature. feet, yeah. yeah. Although that's the first record of him being in England. 
Torrigiana must have been there in 1507 when he's thought to have made a bust of Mary Tudor for her proposed marriage to Charles V. Oh. And that's the wedding that wasn't. That, <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> they went through the proxy, but then it all fell through. He also made three wonderful painted terracotta busts of Henry VII, Prince Henry and John Fisher, the Bishop of Rochester. Uh, Henry's in the B, the, well, Henry VII's in the V&A. I'm not sure where Prince Henry is. I couldn't find an image of him, so I'm not sure that, that one still exists. And Fisher is in the Met, and I've got some pictures there of it. Okay. Of I wonder if the terracotta ones are more fragile. Well, these other two were terracotta. And they survived. Wow. Yeah. I mean, that's quite a famous one of Henry. Yes, it is. Wow, look at the detail in the collar, in the ermine collar. You can see the spots and the texture. Wow, that's really, really neat. And depending, I mean, there's several pictures of, the, of that bust, and depending on which angle you get him at, he's got a completely different, different look. Sometimes he looks, he looks quite just interested, as if someone's talking to him and he's just listening. But the, uh, mm -hmm. another, another version or another angle... I thought I could see in his face, you know, I wish I hadn't had to execute Edward oh. Earl of Warwick. <laughs> well, remember, he has that one strange eye, so... Well, he certainly does in the painting, doesn't he? <laughs> it's all over the place. Yes, but he actually looks quite a bit different than what I was expecting. But in my head, we've got the painting and then mm. his death mask where he's really gaunt. Whereas yes, this well, that's seems... the next picture. Oh. And that's also by Torrigiano. Is it? He did the death mask? Yes, and it just stares out at us, doesn't it? And it's, I think yes, it's really, it does. there's something about it, isn't there? It's just him looking straight into your eyes. Yes. And you can see his Adam's apple and the yeah. marks on his neck. Yeah. You can see the tendons and everything. Mm. And the wrinkles in his eyebrows. Yeah. Like the concern that he carried. You can actually see the, the weight mm. of ruling on him. On the 26th of October, 1512, Torrigiano was commissioned to make the work for which he's most famous in this country, which is the tomb of Henry VII and Elizabeth of York, yes. which lies in the Lady Chapel of Westminster Abbey, for which he received £1,500. But, I mean, it's an altogether... Well, there's two of them for a start, and it's an altogether more fancy it thing, is. isn't it? It is. Now you... I think I can see what you mean by the two styles coming against each other, because they don't have... The buildings, they don't have that filigree. It's mm. way more Renaissance with the elegant cherubs. Yeah, the little putty, they're called. Yeah. The animals at their feet. Yeah, that is all his own work. So, yeah, yes. Yeah, it's true. There was a lot more geometric rigidity, wasn't there, to yes. Margaret's? Yeah. I wish I had even, like, a droplet of that talent <laughs> that is that's quite stupendous that one yes i might uh, i'd like to think i'd go to westminster abbey and go and look at it but i'm not sure i will oh <laughs> i'd love to go to westminster abbey you could spend a whole day there just looking at all the tombs yeah you got to get through london first though wouldn't you to get uh, uh, fly in the fly trouble. out just get dropped off yeah. by a helicopter <laughs> well, they, they could bring it here and put it in our village hall for a bit i'm sure <laughs> we could all go and look <laughs> by 1530 it was being described as one of the wonders of the world. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, another source I read said it was the Lady Chapel, which is one of the wonders of the world, because the whole building is quite spectacular. OK. Henry VIII commissioned Torrigiano to do the work, having rejected several other submissions. The black marble tomb base is adorned with copper gilt representations of the Virgin Mary and Henry's patron saints. Michael, George, Anthony, Christopher, Anne, Edward the Confessor, Vincent, Barbara, Mary Magdalene, John the Baptist and John the Evangelist. OK, why does he have that many patron saints? I don't know, but I thought Vincent. I've never heard of Vincent. Never heard of Vincent either. Yeah, I looked him up. He's the patron saint of compassion for the poor. And I thought, well... well he made people poor. <laughs> Henry made loads of people poor, yes. <laughs> so I could see why he'd adopted him. I understand the patron saint of, um, uh, you said the martyr, Edward the martyr or Edward the mm. confessor. Edward that the makes confessor. sense because he was yeah. a king, king yep. for king. The king but saint. some of the other ones. And why do you have that many? I thought you got one patron saint. I don't know. I'm not sure. But I suppose it's decoration, so 
who probably thought, who, who does he, who did he like? <laughs> <laughs> we'll put all them in. The um, the rather beautiful surround to the thing was was is not one of Torrigiano's. It's uh, somebody else. I find it so distressing that they had to put up that. Um, there's ironwork all the way around it because mm. people were damaging them. Mm. Same with Queen Elizabeth's. So it's like, just keep your hands to yourself so everybody can actually enjoy it. Yeah. Mind you, if we go to a, a, a cathedral, you see lots of graffiti all over the place. I don't mean, you know, paint, paint splotter, I mean carved in. And some of them you see it says six, 1650 or something. You think, wow, 1650. Yeah, that is kind of cool. One that says 1955 and you think, you swine, how <laughs> dare you? <laughs> Very true. If it's really, really old graffiti, it's cool. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Due to the success of this, Torrigiano was commissioned by Henry VIII to make his tomb alongside Catherine of Aragon, oh. which seemed a bit premature since, by my reckoning, Henry was only 28. So he was thinking ahead. Well, you kind of had to. You never knew when you were going to die. True. And look, Arthur was 15 when he passed away. His elder yeah, brother. Yeah, I suppose that might, might be in the back of his mind, might not it? Yeah. Well, for this, Torrigiano was to receive £2,000, but wow. the project was abandoned. I don't know why it was abandoned, but the documentation still exists in which he's called Peter Torrisani. <laughs> <laughs> in that English way of not even making the slightest effort to pronounce <laughs> foreign names properly. <laughs> but he's made other monuments in the Abbey, including an altar. So you can still go and see his work in Westminster Abbey. Okay. He was also responsible for Dr. John Yong's tomb. If, it's, if your name's Yong, don't call your son John, because that's just John Yong. It's just... <laughs> <laughs> and that's in King's College, London. I've never heard of that person. Should we know them? No, well, I, I, I looked him up and I couldn't find any information about him, but he must have been big at the time. He yes. got a tomb by Torrigiano. Yeah. And there's a pic I've given you a picture of him and oh, that's there's a rather okay. sad looking Jesus gazing down. It's a bit tacky, I have to say. It he's flanked by those sort of cherub heads emerging from cabbage leaves that's quite popular in Catholic churches. It is very the overarch looks Roman. Mm. What's what John is laying on looks very Egyptian. It does. And then the bottom of well, I guess the tomb itself looks Greek. Yes. <laughs> well, maybe he was a doctor of history, ancient history or languages or something. I don't like that one. No, it seems a completely different style. Very much so. It looks like mm. somebody else completely did it and they didn't know what they were deciding on doing. So they just added a bit of everything. Mm. No, I wasn't very impressed with that. No. To make these projects, Torrigiano had to call on helpers because that's... The, 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 Artists didn't do things on their own, did they? They had a whole team of people. Yes, otherwise they would get it done in time. They'd spend no. years doing it. Mm. And it's interesting that he didn't look to England for these, but returned to Italy <laughs> to interview potential <laughs> candidates there. <laughs> he tried to persuade Benvenuto Cellini to go back with him, but Cellini refused, seemingly because he just didn't like Torrigiano. Oh, Oh, is that some one of those one-sided things? I really like you. Come join me. I can't stand you. Get away. Yes. <laughs> well, quote, This man had a splendid person, a good start, and a most arrogant spirit with the air of a great soldier more than a sculptor. Makes sense. Yeah, especially in regard to his vehement gestures and his resonant voice, together with the habit he had of knitting his brows, enough to frighten any man of courage. Unquote. So he scowled at everybody. Scowled and waved his arms about and <laughs> shouted. <laughs> he sounds insane. <laughs> and, and Cellini obviously just thought, no, I don't think I can stand that for any length of time. <laughs> Torgiano did many works in England, but he didn't appear to have a very high opinion of the English since he boasted to Cellini of his, quote, gallant feats among those beasts of Englishmen, unquote. Oh. Mm. But actually, it does sound like it, doesn't it, when we've looked at... I mean, it's the Renaissance over the Channel, yes. but it's still the Middle Ages here. Yes. So I can see it must, it must be quite a culture shock for an Italian artist to come here and think, well, wh where's the art? Yeah. <laughs> well, here, here we are. We've got pictures of it, but they all look the same. What's and the engineering. <laughs> engineering had taken a huge... Mm. giant leap so had architecture so they were coming 
to a really backward place. Mm. Send them on to Scotland from there, because apparently everybody <laughs> left Scotland because England was so cosmopolitan. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and I better be a... <laughs> yes. <laughs> Well, maybe uh, Torgiano thought the same, because sometime in the early 1520s, he left England for Spain to make a bust of Isabella of Portugal for her marriage to Charles V. <laughs> everyone's marrying Charles. Apparently, Torgiano had dreams of retiring to a vineyard near Florence and living out his old age in peace and comfort. Sounds like he didn't get it, though. It was not to be. OK. While in Spain, he was commissioned to make a life-size terracotta statue of the Virgin and Child. Okay. However, his commissioner, the Duke of Arcus, either tricked him into accepting a low fee or Torrigiano changed his mind about how much it was worth. Incensed by the Duke's refusal to pay the full amount, Torrigiano then smashed up his statue. Did he die when it fell on him? No. I mean, it's okay. It's his statue. He made it. He can, he can smash it up. I mean, yeah. there's no problem. Except, no. Oh. <laughs> He's in Spain... At the time of the Inquisition. <gasps> and he just broke a religious... He smashed oh, up the Virgin Mary. Oh, not smart. They saw it as iconoclasm uh -oh. and sacrilegion. So one source I read said it was actually the Duke of Arcus who denounced him as a heretic to the, oh, no. to the Inquisition. So I really hope it wasn't sort of bad feeling, sort of sour grapes about the money issue. Yes. Torgiano was thrown in prison by the Inquisition and we know he must have died there by 1528 as there are documents referring to Torrigiano's widow. Oh, no! And it's thought that in despair he starved himself to death. Oh, my goodness. What a horrible way to go. Mm. And that is the sad end of the genius sculptor Torrigiano who achieved so much but who is now mainly known for breaking Michelangelo's nose. <laughs> <laughs> yes, what a what a shock at the end. Yes. And he did make it. Yes. It's mine. That's probably his argument. He probably said, I've made it. I can smash it. What's the problem? Yes, no. you wouldn't have done that if it was horrible. You would have been like, okay, yeah, get rid of it. Start again. Hmm. Oh, that's that's not okay. That seems to be no. my catchphrase right now for everything. That's not okay. <laughs> no. It's quite horrifying. Yeah. Gosh, yeah. you think must what else have he been have walking done. on eggshells in Spain during the Inquisition. All you had to do was upset one person, and if they made a whisper to the wrong mm. ear, you were imprisoned. I hope yep. he wasn't tortured. I don't know. If he was in prison for that long, do we know how long? How many years? Uh, he went to Spain in the early 20s, but I'm not quite sure what, when he made the sculpture. Mm. And he was, he was dead by 28. Wow. So we don't know. Mm. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I brought it right down. <laughs> that's okay. I just... It, we have to discuss that because that's really... What a lot of people might have looked at when they were doing their own actions, the terror mm -hmm. of being in Spain. So ultimately, his mistake was going to Spain at all. Looks like it. Ah. Did his wife go with him to England and Spain? You did mention that she was mentioned. Yeah, I'm not sure. I assumed the documents were in Italy, but I'm not, I don't know why I assumed that. Hmm. So she may have been with him. John Cabot's wife went with him to England. Hmm. Mind you, he's both all three of his kids did, so I suppose it would yes. have been odd to, to leave her behind. But yeah. Yeah. So, on that and side that end... that is the story <laughs> of... <laughs> we hope you enjoyed it. <laughs> hmm. So, we can't tell you what's next because we don't know. No. We do not know what's next. This is kind of fun. <laughs> it's like a roulette wheel. Which one will we release next? <laughs> anyway. Th that is the episode we have on Torrigiano. I can't say it the same way you do. <laughs> we hope you enjoyed it and will come listen to us next time. Goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs>